Okay, we'll get started, please. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Roger Dargaville. I'm one of the supervisors here at the Australian German College for Energy and Climate, and I am uh, one of Martin's four supervisors. Martin made life very challenging for himself by uh, choosing four separate supervisors for this uh, project. And I think we've all been together, or five of us together in a room once during the, the, the course of this PhD. We're hoping that today will be the second time. One of the supervisors still isn't here. Hopefully he'll turn up in a moment. So. Um, I'm very, very uh, delighted to be introducing Martin today for his completion seminar. It's been a, an absolutely fascinating journey. I think I've learned more uh, about this project than what, uh, from Martin than what I've taught Martin. Uh, so he's one of those kind of PhD students, uh, really brilliant, very independent. Martin's from Argentina. He did his undergraduate degree in microbiology at University of Southern California. And he describes himself on his LinkedIn profile as a serial entrepreneur. He has a, a number of businesses that he, he runs in his spare time, which I don't know where he finds. Uh, but leaving that aside, uh, we'll get into Martin's talk in just a moment, which is uh, all about disruptive business models in the energy space, a very, very interesting area. Uh, Martin is, is going to pack a lot into this talk, uh, so we're going to you know, let him get started as soon as possible and, and motor through this. Uh, and there'll probably be lots of questions. Try and hold them to the end. Martin said he'll be available uh, beyond the uh, one o'clock finishing time if you have more questions that you'd like to ask him. So with no further ado, I'll hand over to Martin for his completion seminar. Thanks, Martin. Thank you, Roger, and really thank you all for being here. It's, uh, as you said, a very special occasion for me because I get to share with you, well, what I've been doing for the last couple of years in my PhD. Uh, and it's just amazing to be able to do it here in our college uh, living room. But before I start talking about what I did, I'd like to put special emphasis on how I did it. Because early in my, in my PhD process, I decided to not just take a, an interdisciplinary approach, but uh, an interdisciplinary approach to, to the climate and energy challenge, but also a cross scale one. Um, so, and here I'll explain a bit of how that structure works. In the y-axis, we see a measure of the system size, and I'll, I organize the different systems that I looked at from the very the, the largest system, the Earth system, all the way down to well, as far as I down as I had to go. In my case, even to individual devices at the household level through the electrical power system. In the x-axis, I transition from a systems-based approach one that looks and is grounded in the theory of complex systems, and is particularly useful to look at core sources of problems into a design phase approach. Human-centered, iterative, particularly useful to start proposing solutions. And I'll explain the logics of how that transition uh, um, works and, and why I think they're complementary. Now, my analytical path carries with it the core theme of my work, the energy business system, and with it also a set of critical cross-cutting themes that I look throughout those scales. Naturally, we will start um, here at the very top uh, and traverse down. And in the process comes the three main outputs of my work, which are in the forms of papers and those chapters in my thesis. And each of those uh, chapters and chunks that we will dive into covers a specific scale of that cross-scale analysis and embedded with them a conceptual framework and themselves a, a cross-scale analytical process as well. Um, by the time I get uh, here, I'll explain that logic of going from a systems thinking to, uh, to design thinking. Now, roughly that's the structure of, of how I came about uh, this project. Uh, and before we dive into what I did, I'd like to start for a very important part, which is, which is why. And that's uh, obviously independent to uh, getting uh, an academic title. It relates to the background of this work, the core crux in our Earth system, and also the motivation, in my case, the search for disruptive innovations. Together, they are the driving force of this work that sets the direction or can also be its purpose, which is a fundamental also part of one of my cross-cutting themes. Let's start with, with the background where uh, it's really not the fun part of the story today. You can imagine that the key issue lies right there because since the Industrial Revolution, we've been burning a lot of hydrocarbons. 
I'm not going to go through the old executive summary of the IPCC or go through the ongoing climate impacts we have today, but let me summarize science by saying that we are driving our Earth system through a critical transition across a delicate tipping point. And we're doing this by eroding our global ecosystem's resilience. If we keep going this way, the ride ahead is bumpy with no clear stability ahead because we're going away that stability basin in which the ecosystem lies. In fact, we have a lot of similar characteristics of a system that is driving itself towards collapse. Thankfully, a couple of years ago, we decided in Paris we did not want to collapse. And in that process, we set ourselves some critical targets. Here are our global historic emissions. The energy system is responsible for a bit over 80% of them. And if we want to stay below two degrees, the energy system needs to change its emission course quite radically. Um, more likely, it gets even steeper. And to set those ambitions in Paris, it becomes a radical shift. Together, they form what we know as our carbon budget, the amount of carbon that we can still burn and stay within that stability basin. And most of our finest scientists urge us that we need a global zero carbon roadmap. The problem is that most of our forecasts in our energy system are taking us the other way, at least until 2035. And for me, the critical question is to address the sources of that inertia, of the locking of the energy system. For me, this is so important that I always have to check that I'm dealing with the sources of a problem and not its symptoms. So much that I like to look at very big picture uh, concepts. So, so much that I go back to how life emerged on this planet. The evolution of photosynthesis three billion years ago, the rise of oxygen, its transformation into ozone, the burial of carbon thanks to planetary tectonics, produced life as we know it. And it happened through a great oxidation event that is clearly seen in our Earth's history. Um, and this happens through a set of feedback dynamics, and I, I call this a metabolic singularity, where microbiology meets atmospheric chemistry, where life changes its planet. And some of the basic dynamics are positive feedbacks and negative feedbacks among scales from the cellular level all the way across scales to the Earth system level. Now in just 50 years, we've introduced a new metabolism, an exogenous metabolism, the combustion of hydrocarbons, and we're producing the same spike in Earth's history. Now we're doing this because we're governed by similar dynamics, positive feedbacks and negative feedbacks, positive feedbacks where consumption of energy leads to economic development, which rises our demand for energy, and unless there's negative feedbacks, a system spirals out of control. There's a lot of similarities if we look at the complex uh, adaptive system nature of biology, of society, and even business, which I'll frame as a complex adaptive system. In fact, I use this as a conceptual framework to look at the locking of that combustion. I build on a lot of theories on how socio-ecological systems transition our relationship with nature um, and how those complex adaptive systems actually adapt. My basic point in this slide is that these cross-scale feedback dynamics are very important to analyze if we want to understand how to escape that locking process. When I go back to this uh, image and I think about, well, that disruptive innovation, the fundamental need is to bring innovations that can build resilience at the Earth system level. Uh, rest assured, the planet will still be here. It will survive. But this is the stability basin that our society wants. So with that heavy background in mind, let's go into this motivation, uh, this search for disruptive innovations. The term disruptive innovations was originally coined by Clayton Christensen from HBS, and he described how new technologies displace existing technologies, but fundamentally by being more accessible and affordable, tapping into new customer segments. I thought this was important, but I wanted to go beyond customer segments and market shares. Here lies my guiding research question. What forms of disruptive innovations can produce systemic effects, change at the paradigm level, help us escape that locking process? And it's a guiding research question because through those scales, at each scale, I spin out a specific scale-specific research question. So as you can imagine, now we're gonna dive into these three chapters and we have a, a, a heavy ride ahead. So it's possible that I might go too fast or, or pack a lot of information in the slide. And if that happens, 
I've, I've given you some orange tags to, to pay attention, which summarizes a bit of what we're seeing. Uh, so if you do get lost, uh, follow the orange tags. Let's dive into that top level first, where we look at this, this intersection between the Earth and the um, energy system. I'll start by defining what do I mean by the energy business system. We'll look at the introduction to the framework I use in terms of metabolic concepts. Then we'll look at the analysis of those critical feedback dynamics and finally give you some so what's. If we look at the global energy system, we naturally have to place it within the Earth system and within its societal system. Now the EBS or the energy business system lies right between the source of the resources through upstream, downstream to the retail, to the point of sale. After that, the energy is on the side of the consumers. And I define this in terms of the set of actors, processes, networks, mindsets, um, and norms involved in the business of delivering energy to society. So a lot more than just actors. However, actors are very important and there's not a lot of uh, uh, surprises here. They tend to be the usual suspects in climate change. And in fact, 63% of global historic emissions can be traced to just a set of 90 companies. If we look at them in detail, we have to divide them into three groups. Investor-owned companies, where we find the, the most famous brands, such as Exxon, Shell, BP. Nationally-owned companies, where 50% is owned by a nation state, uh, and they can be publicly uh, traded, such as Gazprom or Statoil, or privately held, such as Saudi Aramco. And finally, the nation states that run part of their uh, business uh, without using an incorporated organization. Now, the first issue with the actor level is that they hold reserves to well overshoot our carbon budget. But the problem is that they exhibit three forms of locking to do that really fast. The first is that their business models are still profitable and competitive, even if we factor in some uh, generous uh, carbon pricing. And the second is that there's investment locking. Investor-owned companies still pump around $700 billion a year just for exploration. The third part is naturally an infrastructure inertia that produces a lot of sunk costs that are really hard to, to uh, uh, have a return on investment. You can imagine if you are the director of a vertically integrated oil and gas company, having to deal with reconfiguring your business model overnight is very complex. This is a lot of very expensive sunk costs that the, the company's asset has. And this is a particularly interesting thing that I'm, I, I think we have to look at. The other concept about the energy business system is that it relies within supply as opposed to demand. Not because demand is not important, but I focus on supply for a couple of reasons, but two that stick to me the most. Um, supply has a vested interest in the energy it delivers. Demand remains agnostic as long as there's com technological compatibility. The second reason is that I, in terms of systems intervention, I tend to think of supply, as we saw, as a set of a handful of actors whereas demand to me is 7 billion people. In terms of those interventions, of course, uh, business actors and classical economics uh, tells us we need to price carbon, and this is critical. It's a very important signal, but I am normally worried about its capacity to reconfigure the fundamental system. Uh, in fact, I think that the fundamental question we need to ask is not what the set of prescriptive policies is to reconfigure that system, but whether society can overcome the forces to, uh, that is preventing them from implementing in the first place. Uh, and we have to do this without the same mindset that initiates the problem. This is a challenge, which is why I put a lot of focus on a, on a holistic framework. And so I'll start by mapping the system, uh, which is a way of looking at it, uh, um, uh, all of its components. And with that, I start by mapping the stock and flow of carbon and energy, the stock and flow of financial capital. I try to map the purpose of the system, the system driver, and finally, the environmental feedback mechanism. To do that, I put the EBS within the societal system, within the global earth system, replace our energy uh, supply chain, which is uh, the stock and flow of carbon and energy, inflows of capital, energy sales, investment capital, subsidies, the first forms of outflows uh, capital uh, towards that supply chain to run it, to operate it. A second form of outflows to marketing towards the end use sector, taxation to the political section, sector, um, the cost of capital to the financial system, which leaves 
a pool of free cash flow available for dividends or any allocation for shareholder value. And I think that perhaps this is a good way to start to ask whether this is a fundamental driver of the system. But of course, this map is incomplete because the supply chain produces CO2, which triggers anthropogenic global warming. And it sends a feedback down saying the side effects of some of these products are not so cool. Uh, so so um, with that map in place, we go back into analyzing those critical feedback dynamics. And we start by naturally looking at the positive feedbacks, which in business is often referred to as the issue of increasing business returns, negative feedbacks, which I frame as the environmental feedback mechanism, and the internal uh, regulation, the purpose or driver of a system. I won't talk a lot about positive feedbacks because there's been a lot of scholarly work in, in this area. I can think of Brian Arthur and multiple other authors, but I do want to highlight some of the work by Jerome Dangerman on the use of system dynamics to explain how in the relationship with the financial and the political system, the incumbent energy system has a, a positive feedback effect that outcompetes any competition. In terms of negative feedbacks, we have to zoom into that red arrow. And to do that, we're literally gonna do that. Uh, that uh, global warming comes normally first at the scientific level through earth system monitoring. From there, I divide it into two main signals, uh, legal, official, uh, uh, non-legal, non-state, uh, where NGOs lie. And, and from there, it trickles down through the IPCC into the UNFCCC, into the geopolitical system, through the economic system. If there is a carbon market in place, it can intensify that signal down to the decision-making process of the EBS. And finally, an ultimate membrane, the core separation of a business in the outside world, it's, it's corporate law, it's legal form of incorporation. I can summarize by saying that the intensity of, the, of that signal by the time it arrives to that decision-making process is significantly reduced. But let's focus into that last stronghold, the relationship between corporate law and the decision-making process. And we have to put the three main actors uh, you know, of those business actors, look at those signals. And I focus on the, of the role of liabilities for shareholders in regards to climate change, the role of the fiduciary duties of directors. And we start, uh, sh shareholders have a limited liability, uh, nationally owned companies as well, but they also have a very powerful 50% owner. Uh, nation states, well, they're subject to international uh, law and principles embodied in the UN. If we look at the fiduciary duties of, of directors, for those that are publicly traded, they actually have to disclose environmental information that can have a reasonably likely effect on, on, on the interest of the company. And this is where a lot of the initial litigations we're seeing in the last couple of years. But in general, the director is required to apply its best business judgment and prove that he's acting in, or she is acting in good faith. Um, another part of law is, is, is consumer disclosure, uh, which is not in place. And by this, I mean a possibility of explaining to the customer the side effects of the product. When we go to a gas pump, we don't see an image of the ongoing wildfires in California that are happening in December. We don't see the melting of the ice caps, the way we see a cancerous lung cell when someone wants to buy a packet of cigarettes. This allows a deflection of that signal. And even if there's something in place, a fundamental core problem is jurisdictions. Geographical arbitrage has been a key uh, use for multinational corporations for a while. I can summarize by saying that just by looking at the filter that limited liability applies, the role of always referring to, I'm applying the best business judgment and the lack of consumer disclosure law, um, we, we have a, a clear way of seeing the asymmetry of information that explains this market imperfection. Imperfect because it imposes forces that can impose a net cost on society. But these are external feedback mechanisms, something that comes from, from the outside that tells us perhaps what to do and what not to do. I'm particularly interested in what happens inside, irrespective of that. And that I frame the function of a system, the purpose of it, which is something that I want to map. So before we looked at liabilities and duties in regards to climate change. Now I want to focus in regards to the best interest of the company in profit maximization and wonder whether this is in fact the driver of the system. Purpose can be placed, yes, within corporate law, uh, but also within business culture and social norms. And these are fundamentally interdependent. Um, this issue is normally framed in terms of the shareholder primacy debate. And the debate goes around whether a director 
has to favor shareholders' short-term benefits or have the freedom to make radical stakeholder considerations? This is a critical question. We want to know whether in a science-based society, the driver of the system can make a 90 or 180 degree swerve, changing its fundamental business model immediately. We want to know that if, this, if in fact there is such duality, uh, is our system even prepared to deal with this level of managerial dichotomy? Now, a lot of this debate often goes around specific historical cases in, in law, such as Dodge versus Ford and Revlon McAndrews, um, and I think that most scholars would agree that directors uh, are quite protected to make stakeholder considerations. They have been, however, very useful in the rise of new innovation forms in corporate law, such as the benefit corporation in the United States, um, but they don't represent the lion's share of the UBS, so I take them out. Now, this equation really changes as soon as we have factoring uh, norms and culture, the soft part of this equation. And for three reasons, directors will, sh will favor the short-term interest of, of shareholders most of the time. First, directors will remain adverse to risks. The law is not so straightforward, and shareholders still have the rights to sue them or file them. Um, the second reason is that there never really is one shareholder in these systems. There's a myriad of them, and perhaps one that's institutional, more depersonalized, can have a more activistic role in its return on investment. So directors often take the lowest common denominator. The third reason is that directors and shareholders share mindsets. The directors are, are, are chosen by shareholders, are rewarded by profits. Most often than not, directors are shareholders because of executive compensation schemes. So with that in mind, so what, Martin? Um, what does this mean? Uh, well, I think that this work presents systemic reasons to hypothesize that the for-profit shareholder maximization purpose of the energy business is incompatible with solving climate change. In fact, this, what I'm trying to say is that this is just not equal to that. It might as well be the source of that inertia. It also tells me that there is no blame to be pointed to specific actors here. It's not the evil director, the greedy shareholder, or the evil brand. It's the very system we've created. And it's so embedded in the fabric of our society that we remain institutionally blind to it. So if I think about critical suggestions to policymakers, I think that this purpose hypothesis brings two uh, things in mind. First is that we have to pay a lot of attention into this research I presented to make sure it's robust, but we have to do it in the climate agenda. We have to talk about these things in the COP meeting. I went through, uh, skimmed through most of the working group three of IPCC, and based on this analysis, this is significantly underrepresented. The second reason thinking about innovations is what type of ideas can I propose? And I think of a mixed bottom-up approach, a key to perhaps the success in the Paris Climate Agreement, where we started by asking countries what was their contribution to climate change. Give me your indices, and then we started the conversation. Well, I think we can have corporate-determined contributions. We can ask carbon majors that fall within a, a specific responsibility when that supply chain to give a science-based, Paris-consistent, business model reconfiguration pathway to 2050. <laughs> Imagine the exercise that this would already prime the discussion. It's a complex exercise. Th this analysis shows that it is, and so we have to deal with it as a society. I didn't even add this, but if I have to send a message to, to energy businesses, to large energy businesses, my message would be, make your business model compatible with earth system science. If not, sooner or later, science will remove your license to operate. Um, so we've gone through that top scale and, and we're crossing into the electrical power system. How are we doing? Any motion sicknesses? <laughs> There's some brown bags in the kitchen. We're doing okay. Um, I don't have specific slides to explain how we're going into the electrical power system because it's almost uh, quite understood that uh, most of the lion's share of the energy transition involves a radical electrification of the energy system and decarbonization of the electricity sector because it's the most cost effective, because we have the technology, so let's get on with it, right? So I, I looked at the different business dynamics and we're going into it um, in terms of also different scales that I'll explain. And to talk about this work, which is already two years old, so I'll, I'll skim through it relatively fast because a lot of things have happened uh, in, in, this, in this area. I talk about, about the role of business models in accelerating that decarbonization of the power system. To look at the background, uh, which is where we'll start. 
uh, I'll, I'll present the framework, and then we'll look at the analysis that, uh, that we did, and finally some conclusions. The background has to be divided into two main parts. Uh, how the power system is, on, is already moving fast towards decarbonization, and the role that business models have in the multi-level perspective of how social technical transitions change. Uh, that's very packed. We can call it BMs and the MLP, which to me sounds like a cool 70s band. Um, yeah. So, but we're sort of here. So the uh, critical way is first is to look at the power system as its paradigm from generation all the way to consumption. We focus on two main tendencies. Uh, one is that generation is being shifted closer towards consumption and that the nature of energy resources is more <coughs> distributed. And these distributed energy resources come in all shapes and sizes today, from photovoltaics, from smart thermostats, from heat pumps, from electric vehicles, and a lot of telemetry uh, in the smart meter um, realm. And this is fundamentally changing a lot of the dynamics in the power system. Now, when I talk about a socio-technical system, before we were looking at a socio-ecological uh, system, the role between humans and nature. Now we look at the role with, between humans and the technology that forms a very important fabric in our society. Think about when before we used to be pulled by horses and now we drive cars. How do these socio-technical reconfigurations happen? The multi-level perspective argues that it happens through the interplay between niches, the bottom up where those new innovations come from, the regime where the incumbent technology and the actors and the norms and laws um, reside, and in the process of shocks and disruptive innovations and reconfigurations, one socio-technical system changes to another. Business models have probably been around since the age of history, but we've actually studied them quite uh, recently, since the age of the internet, because we had to understand how businesses, how they actually made money, where their products and services was free. Think about Google. Uh, it took me a while to understand how they made money. Um, and we used the nine point decomposition of that business model where the value proposition, what does the business uh, bring in value to, uh, lies. And just looking at those different points connected with, uh, with that multi-level perspective and naturally combining these two, I give you the M's and the MLP. Uh, and there's a, a key take home message here that business models have a key role. Uh, and it can be broken down into three main points. Business models roles are in uh, perpetuating that lock-in uh, inertia at the regime level. We literally went through this before. Uh, they also serve as a critical vehicle for new innovations and technology to insert itself within the market. And finally, business models are innovations themselves. They can be disruptive innovations um, just by the way they, they deliver the service irrespective of the technology that resides. So now we analyze it and bring this back into the power system. The first thing we do is just tilt that paradigm from generation to consumption and focus on two critical families of business models. The traditional ones, the utility side business models that focus on bulk energy generation at the affordable price and reliability, and the newer customer side business model that focuses on multiple energy services and local ownership and local benefits. Um, and bring this into the multi-level perspective and there's three key findings. There is already some destabilization happening at the regime level. There's, we already see some initial disruptions of market share from uh, new players, uh, and some that are very systemic and important, such as grassroots innovations, still don't have the scale and growth. And we give three critical illustrative examples. In terms of uh, disrupting niche, uh, we focus on solar power purchase agreement, which essentially Normally, a, a customer will buy its photovoltaic and use its energy. And with a solar developer, uh, the solar developer can install the system and one just pays a tariff for that system. And that is actually done through multiple financial innovations with external investors. So that third party financial role allows zero upfront cost and a decent saving for customers. Uh, we looked at the case of Solar City, which at the time of that writing, it went in a couple of years from zero to 35% of market share in the United States and had uh, maybe eight billion or more uh, dollars worth of contracts in those solar um, PPAs. And when we look at uh, an important systemic uh, niche rising, particularly because it accelerated after the global financial crisis, which is any form of socially active energy, um, we looked at the role of community energy in Europe, first projects that are trying to work on peer-to-peer -peer energy, and those first four purpose corporations where profit is the tool and not its purpose, what is their role in inserting themselves into the energy system? 
we find that they are quite relevant, but they are still not having enough financial uh, access to capital and establishing strong partnerships with large actors. The third level, which is at the regime level, we, um, we looked at uh, how already business sectors were starting to get disrupted by an effect of renewable energies inserting in the market and, and changing spot prices. A spot price in a competitive electricity market is determined by the junction between demand and the accumulation of the different uh, generation resources that are bidding at a marginal um, price because renewables uh, bid at almost zero marginal cost and energy efficiency shifts that demand down. The result is that the spot prices go down. If you're not familiar with that diagram, the renewables lower wholesale prices in competitive markets. And we looked at the case of RVE, a utility giant in Germany, uh, which in 2014, it, it um, mentioned that because of this dynamic, they had a negative net income of $2.8 billion. Ouch. So this thing is, is, is just a factor or a side effect of the energy transition. Another example, South Australia. Uh, conclusion. So the, the, the title is part of its conclusion. Business models have a critical role in accelerating that transition. Second is that if we want to look for disruptive innovations, uh, we can focus in that top right part of the diagram where customers DERs are critical, important, and bring some participation to them. And finally, we put forward a proposition that actually business models can even accelerate more that transition if they bring about structures and, and, and conditions for innovative financial schemes where customers don't have to, to give a lot of upfront cost, a two-way integration of this, those DERs, and reward customer participation socially active um, uh, firms. And with that sort of middle, middle area where we looked at the electrical power system, before going into our last chapter, I want to explain how, how this logic uh, is implemented in my line of thinking to go from systems to design. And I really have to go through some fundamental logic. In the scientific method, uh, we normally start by using a lot of deduction. We know what it is we're looking at, and we know perhaps a fundamental working principle, so we can deduce the result. Let's say um, the economic system is a social system, and by working principle, all uh, social systems are complex systems. So by deduction, the economic system, if those two are right, is a complex system. Now, most of what we do is induction. So we see a set of observed results and we try to derive a working principle, normally in the form of a hypothesis, and then use deduction to test it. Design works in a different way, fundamentally through abduction, a lot of mental leaps where we don't really have an observed result. We have a value we want to develop. And perhaps we know how, we just don't know what that product and service is. Most of the time, we don't even know the working principle. We just have an aspired value, and that's already a, a nice exercise to have. So to do that, we apply a frame between uh, to, to already have a working principle and then use abduction one to start designing that product and service. I'll simplify this because that's exactly what I did. From systems thinking, looking at those critical scales, I, I bring down the, the, the key induction processes that I use for the different hypotheses and propositions and apply a frame to that where I know the value I want to aspire to accelerate that low carbon transition. I know that purpose driven uh, business models are important, that DERs need to have a critical role. And from there, I can have a working and essentially, if, if that sounds a complex, I really wanted to just have a logical and systematic process to go from a large systemic problem to just a workable solution in design thinking. And for me, this is great because now I can start using inspiration uh, and ideation and go into testing and, and eventually validation. And this is an iterative process. Entrepreneurship can be a key um, tool in the validation process of those designs. In even simpler terms, I wanted to use systems thinking as a way to derive insights of key problems, such as finding critical leverage points and design thinking to start proposing solutions. So with that in mind, let's go to our, our, our last chapter. Still okay? No brown bags needed? Okay. Um, so I will talk about a proposed idea and concept of, of, of what I generically call the social virtual energy network, a business model to aggregate prosumers, both producers and consumers of electricity. And I'll go first with the first iteration of that process where I consider the role of virtual power plants in aggregating those prosumers. Uh, consider the rise of the distributed ledger technology, also known as blockchain, 
And in the second iteration, I factor this in and focus on the user experience, the user interface, to tell a bit of what I have in mind. Finally, I'll give you some outlooks of, of some interesting horizons that I might see in the future. The first thing I did was combine a lot of already existing innovations that can be uh, fit within the participatory smart grid edge. I did business model innovations, third party financing of those DERs, the role of peer to peer sharing platforms. We've seen a lot of the rise of Airbnbs and Ubers, social innovation in the form of community owned energy, benefit corporations, and technological innovation, the rise of the Internet of Things and the use of virtual power plants, which I'll explain soon. Into this generic, again, concept of a social, uh, can be seen as a community owned virtual power plant. Uh, a virtual power plant essentially is a technology to aggregate a lot of those DERs, not just the individual devices, but the aggregation of those devices at, the, for example, a household level, a commercial building level, and give them access to the external markets. So I look at also aggregating the, uh, dispatchable uh, sources and some wind farms uh, and, and start by uh, naturally another way of looking at virtual power plants is to think of them, of how we can use them as a platform to enable a peer-to-peer -peer transactive nature between those DERs so that they have their own perhaps internal market and an external market which that platform uh, in interacts with. And it literally orchestrates the different transactions that can happen in between. With this, I have to make a very important clarification, which is we've seen a lot of platforms used for peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, economic systems. Uh, but most of the time, these platforms that enable peer interactions are privately owned, such as Airbnb and, and Uber, which is in stark contrast with perhaps the same platform that is just crowdsourced and owned. And it can be owned by the very cons consumers and users of that platform. Um, and so it perhaps is the same platform, but has a different uh, line of governance. The first thing I did was to start testing this idea uh, and I'm not going to go through the technical details, but looking at how to optimize a set of, of households with smart energy and uh, power components in the tariff. And let me, again, before going or, or without going into the technical part, I want to summarize some of those key findings in smart grid dynamics that I thought were important to embed into the design. Here's our conventional tariff bundled in the energy component, the power component, regulation, and some feed-in tariffs. And if we give... Um, users access to wholesale prices uh, and give them a real-time price changing through that platform, I actually find that this is not quite as simple or as beneficial as possible because if a lot of people do this, they become, uh, instead of price takers, price makers and eventually hurt the market. So if we want to also aggregate a coordinator responsibility at, in that platform, they can use a global signal to make sure that they smooth those speaks. But in a lot of tests, I still find that you still find a lot of local constraints that can be produced dependent on, on the, the nature of the distribution grid. So a, a key conclusion, well, that giving access to wholesale prices is not as simple, and it is very important to factor in the role of the power components, uh, local distribution uh, uh, characteristics. So it needs to have some form of coordination with, for example, a distribution system operator. In many ways, it's a great idea, but it requires a lot of these little important details. Let me run through just very briefly how a distributed ledger works, because it keeps a log of a transaction between two peers. For example, Alice wants to give Bob a, a digital currency, or they want to establish a contract, or um, the transaction is in the form of votes or information, and that log gets uh, cryptographically hashed, uh, and a series of, lo of logs of transactions that are happening are packed within a block. That block gets, block gets pointed to the last block of a block of, or a chain of blocks. And every computer within that network has a copy of that historical uh, ledger of transactions, which means that if I want to tamper what goes on in here with this information and change uh, what happens, I actually have to change the information of every single one of those computers. And this has been particularly interesting as you've seen in the last couple of years. Um, but for me, there's two critical value propositions for, uh, for blockchain. The first is that it, it allows trusted transactions among peers that don't necessarily have to trust each other, but they need to trust the protocol. And it also uh, doesn't require a middle agent uh, in, in the process. And, and the second part, which I find even more interesting, is that through the use of smart contracts, uh, we can establish a contract that acts as, a, as an entity, as a business. And it can be democratically governed and transparently um, 
uh, managed through, for example, peers in the network. So I find that this is particularly interesting to go back to the social energy. Now there's been a, a hype in, in the possible applications of blockchain in the energy system, a lot of new actors. Uh, and even some of those old regime actors are starting to bring in a lot of investment to the size. And I think it's, it's, it's safe to say that the jury's still out of how this will, will play out in the next couple of years. But I think certainly thought it was uh, interesting to, to incorporate. So now with that in mind, uh, I go to, well, what's, what do we know about disruptive business models? They require a high adoption rate. So not the, the niche customer, but the mainstream actor that probably wants to be passive, but wants to be part of something. Uh, and that a lot of these things that I told about the blockchain and the virtual power plants and the pricing are complicated things for, for, uh, for a mainstream user. So I take to assume tendencies that there will be more distributed energy resources and then we will have the capability to have aggregators and demand response ready markets in the near future, which is already uh, happening uh, at a decent pace. And start thinking about, well, how do we design a simple and intuitive user interface that facilitates adoption of this complex social network uh, for a mainstream user? And I'm particularly interested in what are the different use cases of blockchain for that design and to be able to set another interesting research agenda. Before we went from the macro, we went from the air system all the way down, but now we go from, from the bottom level from, for example, a household up to a block, up to a city level. And I hope you, uh, you can appreciate that by telling the story through the user experience, I'm able to pack in a lot of those insights of the smart grid dynamics in my research. So we start by a smart house, an owner. The first thing it would have to do is add those distributed energy resources through its home and area network, store by its fixed loads, add uh, its solar system, add the battery, uh, and literally can do it in, in the phone. Uh, a suit of smart loads, which is any form of device in the house that can alter its, um, its consumption schedule based on a signal that it receives. Um, Finally, if it invested, for example, in a community project, it can add that into its portfolio, or if it's invested with, um, with people in, in the neighborhood on a storage system, and that should be added as well. And with some form of computing power, the, at the household level, uh, it needs to be able to solve some problems on how to uh, schedule these consumptions in, in a logical way. The user has to be passive. We don't really want to have to think about how the electricity market works when we run our dishwasher or we set our, do our laundry. Uh, but there's a lot of devices that can be doing a lot of these micro decision-making processes without even have, having to have any form of discomfort level. What we do need to know is what is happening. We need to understand and trust the protocols of those decision-making processes. So with that, uh, there's three more considerations that the system needs to have. It needs to consider the peers uh, in that regional geographic level. If I live here, I want to know who else is part of the member in that, in that network, virtual network. Also consider the physical constraints because the transactions that are happening between here are different between people in a, in a different distribution line. And finally, make sure that these, uh, these peer um, dynamics are not producing a harding effect in the market. And I need to be able to see within my network who's part of it and who's not. Um, and most importantly, a seamless interaction with that coordinator that are constantly talking, maybe in the day ahead and then in the intraday, solving optimization functions uh, with different algorithms and I can support at least a, a two that can, that can do some of these features. Uh, but once in the intraday level, once those those transactions uh, are done between me and another peer or between me and external market, uh, there is naturally the need for, for logging those transactions. And possibly this can be one of the first use cases of blockchain to keep track of those logs, which could bring different uh, benefits, cybersecurity, privacy, irreversibility, and, and more importantly, perhaps cost reduction through aut automatization. Because there's a already a, a log that we can trust that can go directly into the account. And this is possibly another use case of blockchains to imp implement digital currencies or, or tokenize the economy in a closed microgrid. From the point of view of the coordinator, the aggregator, it's important to have some form of privacy so, so it doesn't exactly know where you are or the, the devices, but it does need to know the relationship between that member and the physical grid. So it needs to have some communication with, with the physical grid. And that, this, is, this is part of a, a possibly another 
form of implementation of, of blockchain because a lot of the physical information of, of, of distribution lines is considered an issue of national security. So we need to be able to request the information from a database without having access to the full database. Um, a uh, um, fourth possible application of blockchain can be uh, packing these uh, virtual energy networks in the form of businesses that live online that can be transparent and democratically governed so that once, if it has profits, then the, main, the peers can decide where those profits are directed. It can be used for, for example, financing new devices at the household level or, or investing into a community project. Um, and finally, a vision of perhaps using a satellite technology for a global energy platform. Uh, but before any of this happens, I think that there is a fundamental change at the paradigm of the biggest application of blockchain, which is, of course, Bitcoin. At the core of Bitcoin lies the input of a proof of concept, a consensus algorithm to the miners that are, that are keeping track of all those transactions. But the real input is electricity. And today is dirty electricity. The output is, of course, cryptographically safe information, but the output is those coveted Bitcoins. So the more we want these, the more we will need to input this. This is the very basic positive feedbacks we looked at before. A possible way of changing is that we change uh, fundamental uh, working of a consensus algorithm. Yes, we have energy as input, but as output, we have clean certified electricity, not the input. A lot of companies are already doing this and starting to, to work on this. In fact, a lot of companies and startups around the world are starting to build these Sven-like uh, platforms, social virtual energy networks. I can think of at least three here in Australia. What I find interesting is perhaps when we start building the platforms that can integrate those platforms so that there can be cross-learning and there can be a lot of uh, mutual collaboration. And eventually, if we find as a society, the possibility of having a polycentric governance, we can build a global energy platform, which for me would be a critical architecture in our transition to our solar economy. Uh, I certainly plan on keeping researching how to get there. Um, and with that, we got to, to the end of, of, of the talk. Um, and uh, that's a very tip. Uh, I had some, some tabulated conclusions when we go into it. Uh, and we can go back to it, but there's a lot of these things that I've already been giving a lot of conclusions uh, already. Uh, uh, there's a, some insights that I, that I think are important in terms of going back to that theory of disruptive innovations, but I'll skip to this and we can go back into some of these uh, basic conclusions. This I cannot skip uh, because this, this work is really not an island. It builds on a lot of authors that are the real meat of this work, and there's a lot. Uh, I've basically put a lot of information together. Uh, but I wanted to share with you some of my afterthoughts. After all this 360 analysis we've done, um, after spending almost four years of, of, of full time thinking about a problem, um, and I think back to that disruptive innovation, uh, and I have to say that it's, it's probably not the blockchain, it's probably not the virtual power plant. Uh, I think back to this global problem we have. Um, and I think that perhaps indeed we might have to change the purpose of how we deliver energy to society. A business that can incorporate Earth as either its shareholder or we maximize value to it. Um, I think it's reasonable to say that for this transition to happen, uh, one thing that might get on the way is self-interest. Because at the end of the day, the EBS is just people. This is like you and me. Um, and indeed, I think that the fundamental transformation for that Earth system resilience need to happen at the individual level. But I tend to think a lot about this as well in my spare time, and I think that perhaps self-interest is not the core problem. Because I think about who is this self that we're trying to maximize interest for? What is, what is the nature of our identification to who we are? Is it me, my physical body? Is it my family? Is it my football team, my country, my religion? Do we dare to expand the notion of this to understand that we are a fundamental extension of our planet? Can we change the degree of how conscious we are in our interrelationship with it? What do we do to it? We do to us? At the biological being, 
the very body is its environment. So much that we're physically wired to self-preserve it. Society is not wired to self-preserve itself, not yet. To do that, to be a true planetary species, I think we have to consider and innovate the way we think of ourselves. And this naturally starts with us. It starts with me. And that is why I think this problem is so hard. Thank you very much. That is very, very impressive, Martin. That was like a TED 2.0, really uh, great stuff. Um, before we get into sort of any deep questions, are there any points of clarification, any questions that uh, people need some help with? No? Okay. Are there any deep, big world problems that you'd like to ask Martin? <laughs> I'll, I'll start off with with a question which I think is, is reasonably deep. Um, if we even go back another step, I think, and we look at uh, purpose of life, uh, it seems for a lot of people it's about collecting capital wealth. Mm. And the purpose of life shouldn't be that, at least in my mind, it should be about having good quality of life. Mm. So do you think there's something about the chasing of the dollar that is, is fundamentally wrong with society? I, I think that, uh, and, and I naturally I like this question, but it's, it's outside the scope of my research. Uh, <laughs> but many times those are the most important questions, uh, which is why I also wanted to share because it's definitely something I want to keep researching because I do find that there's some fundamental dynamics that what you just described uh, that is getting on the way. Um, and we have to be um, very... Yeah, in many ways, very brave to be able to ask those, those right questions and, and to, to see uh, what exactly is. I, I mean, I, I agree that, that our uh, attachment to material wealth and perhaps what that means in how society sees me, um, uh, which also brings other forms of attachment. Um, uh, I think that is where we have to wonder where that comes from. And I also think that uh, a lot of how we see these dynamics in society, I found that I can trace a lot of these, <coughs> I wouldn't say flaws, but these dynamics in me. So perhaps they're not, uh, we see, I don't see um, you know, a war or, or, or a financial crisis as a huge event, but some of the basic dynamics, uh, I, I see them happening in me, my forms of attachment and, 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 and uh, the way I want to perhaps find uh, comfort or security from a social level. Um, so uh, because it's outside my uh, research question, it's not a linear and clear cut how to research these things if they have an effect in, in, a, in the way we deal with earth sciences uh, and, and our capacity to live in this planet are important. So I, I really look forward to finding uh, manageable frameworks to ask these questions um, that we can understand and work with. Okay, thanks Martin. Uh, Adam. Uh, wonderful, Martin. Thanks. Um, so I've just, have you gone through this talk with uh, anyone who works in those major corporations or um, uh, on one side in the fossil fuel industry and the other side, uh, the blockchain parties as well? And what, are, what are your, have you gone through that? Have you heard reactions from them about yeah. this? And the second part of the question is, do their reactions, are, they, are their reactions commensurate with the time frame we have for climate change? Um, I've had a, a lot of talks with the people that are working in blockchain, uh, that's for sure, and, and it's relatively a small niche um, uh, still. Um, I haven't had the chance to talking with the real decision makers in the big energy companies. I didn't take an approach of doing an analysis through, um, through interviews, uh, because I also think that uh, it's very important to talk to the people that are in the boardroom level. Uh, I haven't had a chance of that, and I hope that somehow uh, I'm able to convey some of these ideas to them, uh, ex post, uh, to see what they think. Because I really think that, uh, and, and I, what I try to do is actually put myself as a director of a company, not as someone from outside trying to, trying to put uh, blame to, but actually think, what if I am the director of this company, have all these assets, I have all these shareholders? This is a real problem. 
Um, and, and it's those dynamics uh, uh, at the boardroom level that I think are, are critical and naturally at an individual level because the value systems of each person as part of the boardroom is, is super critical. Um, so I really look forward to somehow getting this to, to engage in that dialogue. Um, in terms of the, the blockchain um, um, crowd, um, I mean, a lot of the things that, I, that I've talked about here, it's been like talking about the same thing. Uh, uh, I think what we uh, are all doing is trying to see how to build it or how to find tools that can enable a lot of that social engagement. Uh, again, that are, that are capable for, for mainstream users because socially active uh, business models and, and energy uh, have been around for quite a while. Uh, they just, they tend to stay within the, the let's say the, the grassroots customer. And the critical thing is that it needs to come into the mainstream user. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that they, they share a lot of mindsets, the people that are working in blockchain, because it's fundamentally a, a, an open source culture. It's like talking with people that are working in uh, Linux, or um, they are fundamentally from, from, from understanding that when we open markets, and that is actually one of, one of the, the conclusions that is that um, the theory of disruptive innovations is not just a, a powerful technology. Many times it's not necessarily powerful. It's just a, affordable for... Uh, the mainstream masses. Uh, for example, when we went for a mainframe computer where it was super expensive to a personal computer where every, everyone can have. Uh, so uh, um, to some extent, going back to that, I think that some of those critical opening markets, the open source community gets that you can reduce margins but gain volume. And, and that is a, a, a shift that, that I also point to in this, is that that, that actually fits within the, the, the formal theory of disruptive innovations. I was surprised, I actually went through this a couple of weeks ago and I was surprised to find that. Yeah. Another, I think we'll just take, take one more question here because we're sort of getting close to the time and probably all, everyone's a bit exhausted. Kind of I'm just wondering how much Martin's thought about government because even if you have these nation technologies like blockchain, actually regulation really gets in can get in the way of these innovations absolutely so you know naomi klein talks about there's a massive imbalance the power is with the wealth the few who have mm. the wealth through multinational corporations etc and and they have basically been able to dictate regulation mm. to the to their benefit yeah and so basically government needs to stand up effectively for society mm. against that and work against that. So, you know, Naomi Klein talks about so basically a social uprising and a sort of a re-emergence of grassroots democracy mm. that is going to cause government through democratic process to react against the imbalance, mm. correct it, and then you'll get the regulatory environment that will let blockchain flourish. Um, yes, and to, to some extent, I the role of governments and the political system is quite underrepresented in my study, uh, and I'm aware of that. Um, um, the role of government in the implementation of blockchain, or even as we see today, some of the changes that are happening today with the internet um, are very important, the, the, with the degree of regulation. Uh, I recently had a talk with, with someone, uh, and I was talking about the possibilities of, of using blockchain in a, in a microgrid for, for islands, and the reaction was, oh, that, that's... That's great. It would eliminate corruption. And then the, the second response was, that would be a problem in, in my country. Um, so, so, and certainly in my country, starting, starting um, with Argentina. So there's, there's a, an important way of how, how to go around that. Um, I, I also think that the, we have to step very fast into becoming uh, a global government and really think about our system governance and what are the type of tools we can use for that. Um, the, the capacity of, of citizens to request the government to do their role um, is very important, but uh, it's not like we haven't been trying to do that in the last decades and, and we see a lot of political swerves. So I think that that's a, that's a key thing. Uh, and, and whilst I, I, I know that I didn't give a lot of focus into the political system, um, also because the nature of multinational corporations have stepped outside governments. And the, the dynamics are, are beyond uh, what my country tells me what to do and what not to do. If my country tells me something I don't like, I'll just go to another country. And I suddenly an Irish company. 
So, so, uh, um, so, so the, <laughs> right. So, uh, th those dynamics, and, and I see the energy business to naturally be within that scale. So, so the political system is very important, but we have to uh, remember that, that, that also one of the things that I didn't talk about, which is how these feedback mechanisms uh, lose alignment, which is the speed of business is way faster in the political system and in the legal system. Uh, so this is a cat and mouse uh, race all the time. And business tends to, to win if it's, if it's internally driven. This is why purpose for me is important. Because if I, as a business, I am aware that the political system and the legal system doesn't have the agility to deal with my side effects, I need to have my own forms of governance. And at the end of the day, society is still the licensor of, of business. Um, the other reason is that uh, political uh, angles to climate change are, are done by a lot of scholars that know a lot more about it than me. So I decided to, to look at businesses. Hopefully that, that answers. Okay, thanks, Martin. We've come to the end of the time, so we'll wrap it up here. If you have more questions for Martin, he's, he's more than happy to, to stick around for, for a while and, and answer your questions. But please join me in thanking Martin for a really inspirational talk. Thank you, really. Uh, can I say one more thing? Because I know that this is probably the last time I give a talk as a student of this university. Um, I really want to thank the, the School of Earth Sciences, the Baragonal Scholarship, but I really want to thank all four of my supervisors. I would not have been able to do this without the intellectual freedom that you've given me. Uh, and more than anything, I, I want to thank everyone in this college. It's quite a privilege to sit here, and I sit right around. Uh, in one of my slides, I talk about uh, the fact that good science stands on the shoulder of, of giants. I really don't know how good my science is, but uh, just by sitting here and working with you feels like I'm starting standing on your shoulders and it's just an amazing privilege to be close to such an amazing talent, more than anything good people. Thank you very much. And Thank you, Martin, for all the inspiration um, and the life that you gave not only to the living room of the college, but to the rest as well. So thank you. And one last announcement. Next Monday, we have our last seminar for the year, which is um, why will Paris likely fail and how could it make it, uh, how could it made, uh, work, I think. Um, anyway, it will be a... Um, as I said previously, a slightly controversial talk, and um, I personally, as a moderator, will try to prove the speaker wrong. But um, so it shouldn't. Uh, it should get a bit interesting next Monday at what's the time? It's at eleven to twelve here. Thank you very much. You can also look at from home if or if you're already at the beach. Uh, sign up to the webinars so you can see it live stream. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Martin.